All right, well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the uh, October Citizens Climate Lobby Call. Uh, one of the things that I want to point to that happened this week is the International Monetary Fund announced that we should enact a $75 carbon tax with the money allocated back to households. Um, that's, uh, I believe, a function of a consistent message, consistently getting something out there so that the, the conversation is taking place uh, very broadly. I do want to also mention that Joe Robertson, who heads up our interface with the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, has made multiple presentations to the IMF about that, but I thought that that was a, a big moment. Uh, and so if you are new to this call, my name is Mark Reynolds. I'm a member of the CCL staff and I'm honored to host today's call. What we do on this call is we get at climate change from multiple directions. So for instance, just this year, um, we've gotten at it from public health, from faith, from business, from politics, from psychology. Uh, so every month we try and address it going from a different angle. And we also have a variety of voices because we know that we need everybody to solve climate change. So we've had uh, half the speakers have been women, half the speakers have been men this year. Three have been people of color. Um, about seven have been people who are kind of from the left. Uh, two, as of today's call, more from the right. But the thing that we're most excited about is this is the first time that we have a student on as our, as our guest speaker. And that's just fantastic because we need everybody's voice. Um, we actually have two people for Students for Carbon Dividends on today. Uh, Kira O'Brien, who will be on any minute now, it was, it, her plane was delayed, so she may be a little bit late, but fortunately, Alex Posner for Students for Carbon Dividends is with him, with us. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Ricky to unmute Alex's line, and Alex, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what got you, wh why did you guys start for Students for Carbon Dividends? So why don't we just start there, and we'll have Kira join us as soon as she can. Sure, all sounds great. Can you hear me? Yes, you're loud and clear, Alex. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you, first off, for having us. Uh, yeah, as Mark mentioned, my name is Alex Posner, uh, president of Students for Carbon Dividends. Kiera, uh, uh, partner in crime, will be jo joining momentarily. I, uh, her flight was unfortunately delayed. She's on the tarmac for two plus hours, but she will be here shortly. Uh, it is, yeah, it's a great honor for us to be on the call. We are huge fans of CCL and the wonderful work you do. Uh, and so uh, admire the, the many opportunities to work in common cause. Uh, so yeah, just to, to answer that question, talk about the origin story, the provenance of S4CD. Uh, we were, uh, I, along with George Gemelis, uh, who's also on our leadership team, uh, were taking a number of courses as students and were, I think, really impressed by the expert consensus, particularly among economists on the merits of carbon pricing, on the economic and environmental wisdom, and, uh, and I think one of the things that was striking for us was sort of what we identified as this huge gulf, uh, at least in our conversations with our student peers, uh, between the sort of expert conversation and the more popular conversation. Uh, and all the sort of dominant organizing activity on campus was fossil fuel divestment. And that's, there's cert that's certainly something that appeals to many students, but wasn't appealing to all. Uh, and our sense is that the, the number of students who are interested in being involved in, this, uh, in the climate issue and in a concrete way, laser focused uh, on penetrating to the central question of how do we get emissions down uh, was, yeah, higher than the, the actual number who were involved and that there could be a real opportunity to bring people together around uh, carbon pricing-based, market-based solutions and on a bipartisan basis. So uh, we, we got together sort of, uh, yeah, we got together and started reaching out to different student groups. We, we had no idea at the start what the interest level would be. And uh, I had formerly interned at the Climate Leadership Council uh, and identified the carbon dividends framework, same framework embodied in the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividends Act uh, as a real promising basis for bipartisan agreement for a consensus solution that's both sort of pro-economy and pro-environment. Uh, and we use that as the sort of intellectual basis 
uh, intellectual center of gravity in reaching out to student groups across the political spectrum uh, and with a special focus on uh, college Republican groups and conservative groups on campus. Uh, yeah, one of the things that had come up in, in conversations on campus was that this really isn't uh, a, a, a partisan divide among the youth generation like it is uh, among some of the older generations. Uh, we're across the board, young people more likely to have studied climate science in school, have decades of life ahead, uh, and hence the most interest uh, in addressing this challenge is sort of raw self-interest, our economic futures at stake. Uh, and and a real uh, yeah a a real sense that we need to be talking maybe even debating solutions but that this needs to be a solutions focused conversation. So with yeah with, with that in mind we were really delighted by the response we got uh, and were able to pull together a founding coalition of uh, uh, back this was back last year spring of last year 23 college Republican groups. Uh, six college Democrat groups, five college environmental groups. This was the first time a chorus of college Republican groups had ever backed a national climate solution. Never happened before. Uh, and by extension, the first time uh, that a bipartisan uh, student coalition had ever done the same. So since then, uh, founding coalition has more than tripled to 100 plus uh, leading student groups across the country, about 50-50 uh, about 50-50 conservative, 50-50 uh, environmental left of center. So we're, we're yeah, really proud of the progress we've made and really heartened by uh, the, the bipartisan interest and in actually uh, focusing on common sense solutions and seeing this problem solved. That's really, really well done, uh, Alex. Thank you. Um, the question that I got the most often in advance of this call was about outreach to students and in particular, you know, outreach to Republican students. So um, if you were going to advise an old liberal like myself, <laughs> you know, what would you recommend I do to do outreach to, to students, in particular uh, uh, Republican students? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So we have, uh, you know, this wasn't something we knew at the start. We learned through a lot of trial and error, uh, but happy to share uh, the insights we have. I'd say first, uh, first is the importance of retail messaging. So I think at the start, we had hoped that there could be sort of one unifying pitch that appeals to everyone. Uh, and in the, the reality is we've come to uh, appreciate that this is two separate journeys through the desert to the same promised land. So, uh, you know, different strokes for different folks and in the same way something like the recent Criminal Reform Act uh, was passed on a bipartisan basis, but had separate messaging to left and right, uh, I think the same is true here. So retail messaging, number one, we actually have, when we're doing outreach, separate pitch materials, depending on the audience. That's number, uh, number one. Number two uh, is the value, when possible, of trusted messengers. Uh, so we, we like to have folks who are young conservatives reaching out to fellow young conservatives, uh, young liberals, reaching out to fellow young liberals, uh, there's just greater validation and trust that comes from that. So wherever possible, highly recommend uh, the value of trusted messengers. Uh, I would say number three is, and this uh, perhaps t uh, aligns with some of the insights from last month's call, which I had a chance to listen on, uh, listen in on, uh, but leading, leading with values, not policy details. Uh, by all means, policy details are part of the conversation, but you shouldn't open by talking, a border, uh, talking about border carbon adjustments that sets no one's heart aflutter. Uh, sorry to break it to you. I mean, I love policy, but uh, it's, it's just not the way to excite. So really lead with values uh, and, uh, yeah, sort of set the stage of telling a broader story of, yeah, there are four, four pillars or there's a policy and it has these details. Uh, but where does this fit in? Why are we doing this? And I'm particular on the conservative side, which we always like to highlight. I've, uh, I've majored in uh, U.S. history, is the long legacy of conservative leadership on environmental solutions, from Teddy Roosevelt in the national parks, to Nixon and uh, the EPA, to Ronald Reagan and the Montreal Protocol, to H.W. Bush uh, and acid rain. So there really is a proud heritage here. Uh, and this is not at all about a deviation uh, from the past. It's about reclaiming that proud legacy. So sort of framing it in those terms as part of a broader 
uh, broader story, a very true story, uh, I think helps take something that can just be sort of you're zoomed in really close, just policy details and zooming out and telling a, a broader picture of, of where this fits in and, and the importance of, you know, conservatives having a seat at the table. If, if uh, I, at this point, uh, a climate solution, a response is, uh, is inevitable. Uh, so the question is, what, what will it look like? Uh, and if you don't have a seat at the table, neither will your principles. So leaning in uh, and engaging around a market-based solution such as carbon dividends uh, is, is a real way to make sure uh, conservative market-based principles are leading the charge. Uh, I would add two other quick things. Mm -hmm. One, uh, focus on uh, the human consequences of climate, uh, less the environmental consequences. This was something uh, touched on at uh, CCL National Conference in 2018, but always worth highlighting is that the, uh, the, the language of climate is very often, oh, uh, or is heard as, oh, let's sacrifice on behalf of polar bears, let's sacrifice on behalf of penguins. Uh, and what, what we always try to focus on is, which are very real and pressing, are the human consequences, the economic consequences, the implications for national security. Uh, and uh, what we say to people all the time is we're asking, you know, we're asking you to be selfish. That's it, that's the request. This is in our self-interests. Uh, and yeah, this isn't about uh, uh, protecting the planet. This is about protecting our families, our communities, the people we know and love. Uh, and then the last thing I would say, particularly uh, tailored towards young people and young conservatives. So the, uh, yeah, the last thought is just the importance of meeting students where they are. So understanding people's uh, academic commitments, what, what students are thinking about, which is successfully completing their degrees, landing a successful uh, job, paving their careers, all of that. So if you can make engagement on climate align, align with those sort of personal self-interests, uh, I think that's a recipe for engagement success. So for example, we have an upcoming event uh, with a college Republican group and co-sponsored by uh, uh, a academic department on campus and making attendance something where students can get extra credit, for example. So okay. just thinking about those things uh, as extra, extra motivators. Anyway, I will hand the ball over to Kara, who has lots of expertise in this area. Uh, and yeah, over to you. Fantastic, Alex, thank you. Uh, Kira, you know, one thing I'd like to start with is uh, a lot of us saw you testifying before a Senate committee. And I think for a lot of us who are, you know, kind of politics and congressional junkies, that's something we always thought, you know, well, what would that be like? You know, uh, it's one thing to see somebody doing it, but then somebody you know, there you are actually testifying, you did a fantastic job, but what was that actually like? Honestly, it was a lot more fun than I could have reasonably expected. Uh, I think the best part that I had fun finding out about testifying was that so much of it is about the story. It's about the collaboration. People really just wanted us there to share our individual stories. And it was a really incredible process of uh, getting to share my personal experiences with these members who legitimately wanted to collaborate on these policy issues. Yeah, great. Well, you did a fantastic job. I hope you get to do it again. Thank you. Yeah, and the only thing is, is I think you should at some point if uh, have somebody tug your sleeve and say, the advice of counsel, I can't answer that question just for to, you know, <laughs> ramp up the fun. Uh, so tell us a little bit of your background. You grew up in Alaska, right? I did. I grew up in Ketchikan, Alaska, which is a small island community in southeastern Alaska. Um, and that really informed a lot of my views on climate. Uh, but it also informed a lot of my politics. Uh, so inherently, I'm a Republican, but I'm a Republican that cares about environment and climate issues. And what in particular, uh, you know, what is it about Alaska that, that has you be passionate? Um, uh, you know, say a little bit about what it was like growing up there that, that has you have a passion for, for the environment. It's really unlike anything I can adequately describe to you guys. I grew up in a fishing town, uh, so the primary industry was fishing. Before that, it was forestry. Uh, I grew up in the largest intact temperate rainforest in North America, the Tongass Forest. Um, really just like so much of the life there is about being outside and being with the land. Um, and it really, it really shapes the whole way you look at the world. Um, and then moving to the East Coast for college was just so incredibly different, um, both in just how people interact with the world and with how the environment was around me. 
Mm -hmm. And so like, did most of the kids in your neighborhood get accepted to Harvard? <laughs> uh, no, uh, there, there was only a handful of us over the past uh, dozen years or so, but uh, it, it's a very different path than many people I grew up with. Yeah. Yeah. So Alex used this really interesting word. He talked about retail messaging and how yeah. you uh, customize your messaging depending on if you talk to conservative or liberal students. And he talked a lot about what the kind of themes are for conservative students. How do you modify that when you're doing outreach to liberal students? Um, well, for me, I focus, regardless of who I'm talking to, I focus a lot on the story. Uh, I think that the personal connection is really just so crucial. You can talk about policy until you're blue in the face, but if people don't connect with you, it really doesn't get you very far. Um, but when I'm discussing policy with liberal students, I think a lot of it, at least from coming from my perspective and my side of the aisle, is about showing people that I do care. Um, because I think inherently a lot of people are skeptical of Republicans um, caring about climate issues because in the past it really has not been at the forefront of uh, Republican politics. So demonstrating to liberals that I interact with that I do care about these issues legitimately. I'm not trying to pull a fast one or win anything for partisan gain. I truly believe that this is a bipartisan issue uh, that is so pressing that we need to work together on it. Yeah, great. All right, I'm going to open up to the chat in just a moment, but uh, just tell me a little bit about the ambitions for students for carbon dividends. What, how, how, where do you think this can go? Uh, well, we're on campuses across the country right now, um, and we've been doing events, a couple of events every month. So I've been very, very excited with our progress since we launched last February, um, and I'm really excited to see where we can expand from here. Yeah, great. Fantastic. All right, well, let's, let's just check and see what people are, are wanting to know in the chat for a couple of minutes, if you don't mind. Yeah, one question okay. mark um, that we had in the chat was, um, is there, you know, have you seen any success in trying to bring, uh, say, young Democrats and young Republican clubs together on campus to sort of host bipartisan um, uh, events? Um, I don't believe we've done any events, but as far as original co-signers of Students for Carbon Dividends, we did have some Democratic clubs and some Republican clubs on the same campuses. Um, Yale, I believe, was one of those, as was the University of Michigan. Great. The next question we got, uh, you know, are, are the, uh, the groups with the uh, Students for Carbon Dividends or even Republican student groups, are they uh, actually um, lobbying and reaching out to their members of Congress as well? Uh, it depends group to group, um, but I, we as a 501c3 organization haven't done a whole lot of lobbying at this point. Um, I think that's something that we're hoping to expand to in the future, uh, so we'll, we'd like to see that getting underway. Let's see. And um, uh, a couple of folks have asked about, um, uh, you know, if your organization, you know, what was, what's your, your, your target goal? What's your biggest goal that you would like to see achieved with students for carbon oh. dividends? <laughs> well, we'd like to pass carbon dividends. Um, that's the ultimate goal uh, because we really believe that this is the policy that will make the most gain on uh, progress that we need to on this issue. Um, but beyond that, uh, we're really excited about the campus network that we've created um, and the dialogue between Republicans and Democrats on campuses across the country. And a couple of folks have asked about this question about justice. Uh, you know, what do you say to people on the left who say they don't support a price on carbon because of, you know, uh, environmental justice issues? Uh, one of the conversations that I've enjoyed a lot recently is talking with people about using all the tools in the toolbox. Uh, even if you are somebody from the left who thinks that there are better ways to approach this issue, a carbon price is a tool in the toolbox and economists have shown that it is the most powerful tool we currently have in our toolbox. Um, and so I believe if you do care about justice that you should be caring about a price on carbon. And one last question I think we got there is uh, here is uh, if you talk a little bit about the role that college Republicans um, play around elections and why it's so uh, significant that students for carbon dividends have gathered such, you know, support amongst college Republican clubs across the country. Uh, yeah, well, college Republicans across the country, every election cycle are busting people up to at least where I am in New Hampshire or in Iowa or they're going door to door. They are the ground force of campaigns. Um, in a large part because these are people who want jobs in the future with campaigns, um, and in a large part because you can convince college students to spend hours knocking doors, which you really cannot convince a lot of people to do um, in the general population. Uh, so 
it's really important to have students engaged on issues like this, on issues that will require a mass of people to make progress, uh, because students are the workhorses. Uh, they've been the ones that are expected to do this, and college Republicans have that infrastructure already in place. Kira, what about the um, economist statement? Do you find that has traction with students? Does that does that appeal to them? Does that is it impressive to them like it is for to me? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I had several friends at Harvard this past week send me uh, pictures from their Ec10. It's the Intro to Economics course. It's the largest or the largest course at Harvard. Period. Um, hmm. And the economist statement was presented in lecture uh, because their professor signed on to it. Um, which is really very impressive when you take into context that the uh, former professor of Ec10, uh, Greg Mankiw, was one of the original policy writers of at least the carbon dividends framework that we support. Um, and then the professor who took over has a very different political background and like philosophy, um, but he is also a signer of the statement. Uh, so he talked a lot in lecture apparently about how it is the largest statement in the history of the profession, uh, which says quite a lot when you think about um, telling all of those 700 people who take this intro to economics course. Wow, that's fantastic. Ricky, anything else in the chat we should ask? Yeah, I got one more question. Just um, uh, the, the, I guess the interplay between, you know, what you guys support, which I, we, I think we all believe is a, more like the CLC plan, the Climate Leadership Council plan on dividends and what we support and the interplay between those two and the whole ecosystem of ideas and, you know, just basically talk about that and, and your role uh, as in students for carbon dividends in that, in that interaction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think ultimately we all have our ideals, um, but what it comes down to for us is that we recognize that we are not legislators. We are not gonna be the people who are making the final amendments on these bills. And the amount of daylight between the CLC bill and the CCL bill are, is really not that much. Um, so we think that when it comes down to it, it will be the legislators who will have the final say on that. Uh, and I think as, we all, as long as we all do our part to get the, the main message of carbon dividends to the forefront, um, then we've done what we can do. Fantastic. Kira, that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, also, Alex, thank you for jumping on <laughs> to cover the first few minutes. I'm glad that you made it wherever you were headed. Uh, and is there anything else you'd like to just say as a closing comment? Um, yeah, no, thank you all so much for what you do on this issue. Uh, it's very inspiring to see everybody coming together in support of such an important issue. Great. Okay, fantastic. And you're welcome to stay on for the next few minutes. We just want to go over some of the things that have happened since uh, last month's call. Um, but thank you so much. It was great having you as one of our uh, part of a plenary uh, session in the 2018 conference. And we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, I want to go over a kind of a perspective of where we are at this point uh, as a combination of some of the things that happened since last month's call and also um, where we are three quarters of the way through the year. So, um, so far this year, we have added 49,112 um, new uh, members. So that's significant, and that's a lot of you doing tabling and outreach events. We just got a spreadsheet yesterday with an additional 3,000 people from Florida. Uh, really happy to, uh, to get that uploaded into the system, but that's a, you know, almost 50,000 people we've added already this year. So thank you all for, uh, for what you've done there. Also, 48 of, 48 of 50 states now have endorsements of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. 48 of 50, I would bet by the time we get to next month's call, we will have all 50 states represented. Uh, there are now 53 municipal resolutions um, in support of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. That represents 14,583,733 people. So that's 14,583,733 people and 733 people in those municipalities. So far year to date, you have published 2,580 letters to the editor. Uh, that's running at a clip of about 280 a month. If during the last three months of this year, we can bump that up to 300, we will break our all-time world record of, from last year of letters to the editor. So uh, I'm hoping that we can just get a little bit more energy there. Similarly, uh, we have had 421 op-eds so far this year. That's running at about 47 a month. If we can keep that clip up, we will also break the world record for op-eds and I'm, I'm a big fan of that. 
A lot of groups continue to have great success with editorial board meetings. Uh, we have had, um, uh, just since last month's call, the Grand Junction Sentinel, we had a meeting with them and the next day they published a, uh, an editorial in favor of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Also San, San Antonio, we like seeing those from Texas since last month's call. Uh, the Market Choice Act came out since last month's call. So that's another bipartisan bill um, that is significant. The uh, action teams are also incredibly busy. Just in a week's period of time, these are the action teams that are meeting with guest, guest speakers starting from a couple of days ago till the end of this week. October 9th, the Peace Corps action team. October 9th, the Grass Tops engagement action team. October 14th, the Conservative Caucus action team. October 15th, the Business Climate Leaders. October 15th, Peer Support. October 16th, Climate Culture. And then October 17th, Episcopal Action Team. So uh, that is significant also. And as you know, we've had the Climate Solutions Caucus in the House for quite a while. We do now have the working group uh, begun in the Senate with Senator Coons and Braun. Um, we're hoping to have more exciting news on that uh, shortly. I also want to read you a note we got from um, Jill Mitchler in uh, Congressional District 8 of, of, of Wisconsin. So this actually happened in August. It just didn't get to me um, until now. She said, I want to tell you about something we did in Wisconsin 08 in-district meeting this week. Dr. Marty Finkler is a retired professor emeritus of econo economics at Lawrence University in Appleton. He became involved with CCL Appleton Fox Cities chapter several months ago after signing the economics, economist statement and was interested in participating in lobbying. Marty reviewed the spreadsheet of co-signers and contacted the other five economists from our congressional district to see if they'd be interested in meeting with our representative. Although none of them have any experience lobbying or rarely if ever signed on to a statement like the economist statement, all of them were interested. In mid-July, we requested an in-district meeting so the economists could meet with our member of Congress. Although we have a very good relationship with our Republican congressperson, who is also a millennial and on the Climate Solutions Caucus, we informed the schedule was already full and we'd be placed on a waiting list. I followed up the week later with a thank you email and, and the economist statement. About a month later, we were notified that there were 30 minutes available on the, in the next week. Four of the six economists, including Mar Marty, happened to be available at that time, and we had our industry lobby meeting on Tuesday. Marty led the meeting, and it went very well. I do think we moved the needle. So I just think that that's a really good example of, you know, the economist statement comes along, over 3,500 economists making the largest statement uh, of every uh, ever group of economists in the U.S. supporting uh, a carbon dividend plan and then inviting those people to be in the meeting. I thought that that was remarkable. I don't think you should all feel guilty if you haven't done that. I just want to say it's a good example of other people getting creative and doing something interesting with the situation. Okay, what are we doing this month? Well, in Canada, <clears throat> we are going to be focusing on media. The election is right upon us, so that's both um, traditional and social media. Let's make sure we make a big push um, and uh, very excited about what potentially will happen there. We'll see. We'll know soon. All right, so there's a couple things we're inviting you to do this month uh, for the U.S., and that is organize uh, for the call Congress Day and the November Lobby Day. So we have a couple of dates that you could call in. We'd like everybody to have the experience they're participating in November. So for those of you who are able to come, that's great, but most of you won't be there. So we do wanna make sure you can call in. We wanna make sure your group gets together and plans your meeting, that you follow up from last month of if there's people that you wanna have there and that you can support them, uh, great. Let's, let's, uh, let's get people, particularly who've never been there, a chance to get to DC find out that there is way more access to your government if you just ask for it. And then we're asking you to tweet your members of Congress on November 12th um, on our lobby day. Uh, so hopefully we're developing a lot more um, Twitter users uh, towards that effort. Okay, last year there were 575 people who signed in for our November, what we called Congressional Education Day. And we called it Congressional Education Day last year uh, because we didn't have a bill. And so what we've done in the previous five Novembers is we've gone back 
we had taken the notes of what we'd learned in June. We'd study them and we saw not only do what members of Congress and their staff have to say about solving climate change, but we also see how that's changed over time. And so we called it a Congressional Education Day in previous years. We're calling it Lobby Day because there is a bill. And so, yes, we will have that information. Yes, we're providing training already on that information. But because there's a bill, we're going to be asking for um, support on the bill. I'm getting very, very positive feedback from our DC office about the support for the bill um, in DC. Uh, you know, there's 66 co-sponsors now. That's the most number of co-sponsors ever on a carbon pricing bill. Uh, and, and one of the things that we've learned is, you know, some people like to co-sponsor bills, some don't. Some bills go to the floor with only two or four co-sponsors. So it's, it's great that we have so many, but we're also getting a lot of feedback from both sides of the aisle that there's a lot of additional people that will vote for the bill when it gets to the floor. So we are gonna continue to build momentum towards that. So there's 575 people signed in. There are 610 people already pre-registered for November. So we'll look forward to seeing all of you in a month. There's 185 meetings scheduled so far. So that's a little bit ahead of last year. So we're hoping to beat last year's total of 400. One of the things that is really interesting to me is what we're seeing in the analysis from June. 20% of the members of the House and Senate that we saw in June made the statement that they would like to make climate change a bridge, not a wedge issue. We just started saying that a year ago. And so now, again, when we, when we report back the meeting notes, we only report the things that the members of Congress and their staff say. Obviously, they're heavily influenced by what we ask and what we bring up. But if we've already got 20% of members of the House and Senate we see who are saying, let's make this as a bridge, not a wedge issue, just like I was saying at the start of the call, the, the uh, effect you've had on the world of more and more calls for a carbon dividend plan, also you're getting traction with making this a bridge, not a wedge issue. So that was something that jumped off the page at me when I was looking at the analysis for June that I'm excited to report back when we get to Congress. Okay, in just a moment, Ricky's gonna unmute everybody's line. And if you wanna give a shout out to our guests, uh, Kira, and Alex, that would be fantastic. I thought they did a great job and it's really nice. We need every possible voice to solve this. We need old people, we need young people, we need people from the right, from the left, from every possible background. So Ricky, you wanna go ahead and unmute everybody and we'll give our guests a shout out for, and a thank you. 